today on Call Out. Nelson Search and Rescue's new boat is on its first mission. Right there in the rocks, cliff face. It's gonna be a touch and go. And later, predicting the weather, the tools of the trade. This is a sunshine recorder. Actually one of the few that are still left operational in the country. Saturday morning, 6.30 a.m. Nelson Search and Rescue was called out for a boater in distress. They're searching for Piper Jade and her son Keegan. Piper, a single mother and recent arrival to Nelson, had taken her son out for a paddle in their new canoe the day before. The initial information was a boater in distress. Historically, in that area, the Groman Narrows, there's an island there. Quite often, boaters have some distress and end up on the island. This is what we figured it would be. We got in the boat, we drove down the channels to the area. Didn't see anyone on the island. The fire department was across from the island on the highway and were telling us there was people on the cliff face. This is the first mission for the team's new rescue boat. They'd spent two years and hundreds of volunteer hours fundraising and planning for the craft. In our area, Kootenai Lake is a large body of water. Because it's long and narrow, and the winds come down from either end of the valley, it turns into the ocean out there. We wanted a craft that could respond on the lake in any kind of water, summer, storm, winter, day or night. So this particular boat was designed to have twin engines completely independent right from the fuel cells. Something failed on a system, the other one was there to protect us. FLIR systems, forward looking infrared. So we're driving at night, we can see if there's obstacles out there. All the normal communications, GPS, plotter, depth sounders, drop cameras for searching. We had just kind of gotten everything installed, figured out, got our protocols in place. Bang, first call right away. They're right in front of your, right across the fissure, right uh, to the left of that fissure that runs up the hill of the rock bluff. Yeah, you're gonna have to go downstream, come upstream. I don't see him yet, though. We know exactly where you mean. Hello? We drove right past the cliff face. Didn't see anyone, didn't hear anything. Turned around, came back by the area, Hello? got on the loudspeaker, asked whoever's there to call out. Back upstream. Right there in the rocks, cliff face. It's gonna be a touch and go. They spot Piper Jade and her son Keegan huddled precariously on a ledge above the swift moving current. The team must maneuver the boat into position against the cliff face and hold it there under power in order to get them both safely into the craft. How she managed to get her son up into that, that little fissure of rock and up onto that little plateau, you know, 10 or 15 feet out of the water. I mean, that took some effort. They definitely wanted out of that cold water. Once we realized where they were, we had to maneuver the boat into a place where we could make it stable, pushing it against the rocks, holding position. Doing this procedure, putting that bow against that rock, did do a bit of damage, and we just polished the thing. It was brand new, so it was a bit of ouch, but you know, critical time, got to get it done. I jumped on the front of the boat, was trying to get them to come down off the cliff. It was quite steep, you know, they couldn't just jump in. They were very cold, the dexterity just wasn't there. Put your bum right on that rock. Young Keegan is visibly chilled to the bone after spending the night in his damp clothes. I literally had to tell them where to place their feet, put your foot in my hand, take my hand, step down, I'll grab you. Very cold, you know. You spend a night out wet early in the spring, not much thermal protection. It's going to affect you a great deal. Get you warmed up. Once they were in the boat, into the covered cab, blankets on them, giving them a big bear hug, getting that body heat going. I just wanted to crawl right into him. He was so warm. He uh, gave us each of both a hug, told the guy we got to go quickly, and then they called the ambulance, and I guess the ambulance was there waiting for us at the dock when we got there. This rescue was a classic grab-and-go. 
uncomplicated and with a happy ending. But how did this story begin? It was Saturday morning, beautiful, sunny, hot day. It was my day off. I had nothing to do. Keegan was sitting in front of the video games again. And I was feeling guilty because uh, I, I had to clean my house, but I really didn't want to. And I thought, mm, how am I going to get my kid off the video games? So then we just picked up this canoe a couple days earlier that we had tied down at the dog park because we couldn't pick it up to put it on our car. And uh, I thought, oh, well, let's go canoeing, no problem. So we uh, jumped on our bikes, went down and picked up the canoe and uh, started paddling, just like that. <laughs> I guess the plan was just maybe go around the beach a couple times, just stick around the shore and stuff like that. But we were having so much fun that we decided to go across the lake. And when we got there, there was this little cave, there was rocks, it looked like there was fossils and stuff like that. It was, it was so cool. They decide to continue downriver to Tagum, a six and a half kilometer journey, going through the whirlpools and eddies of Groman Narrows in the process, without life jackets and with little canoeing experience. And those little whirlpool things would spin us around every once in a while, but it's a beautiful, hot, sunny day outside. It's like doing uh, donuts in the snow in the wintertime, you know, it's cool. So we continued all the way down to Tag and made it there, played there for a while. And then uh, I thought, well, it's getting dark now, so the responsible thing to do would be go back. So we just jumped back in and, and uh, started paddling. And it was going great again up until, uh, you know, halfway through. They reach Groman Narrows again. This time, its powerful whirlpools are no longer fun. We were, like, trying to make it so it wasn't going to turn over, but that failed. Before I knew it, we were in the water, bam. And it almost felt like a hand was grabbed onto my ankle and was starting to tug. I started getting pulled underneath the whirlpools, and I couldn't see Keegan anymore. He was getting pulled down as well, but for longer and longer. And when I got up to the surface, I took in a deep breath, and then after I held it, but that didn't work. I was so scared. I never felt more out of control in my life. When I was going downstream, I was trying to catch on rocks, but my hands were wet and slippery, so that didn't help at all. As I grabbed on some cliffs, I saw my son drifting away behind me, and he was not close enough to grab the cliff, so I had to grab him, give him my spot, and then I had to now continue down the river she was underwater, and I thought, will she come back up or not? But she got back up to the surface, and then she managed to get to the rocks. Finally, I was able to grab onto something, and then pulling weeds in various crevices and whatnot, climb back to where he was. I looked at the rocks and found, and it almost looked like a staircase up to the um, ledge. And so I went, and I figured out how to get up. And then we climbed 15 feet, like we rock climbed. We never rock climbed, but we, we rock climbed up there, and we sat there. Huddled on the small ledge, it was the beginning of a long, cold night. It was about 8.30 now at this time. I could see the cars on the road passing by, and there was nothing I could do. We were soaked. It was cold. It was dark. We were stuck there. Me and my mom were cuddling up together. I was starting to breathe in my shirt, and then Mom copied, and then Mom was starting to feel heat. He was shivering. I thought, oh, I'm such, I'm the worst mother ever. I just felt so badly, I thought. I don't even deserve to be a mother. Daylight comes, and with it, a lucky break. Across the water, Bill Rustier arrives to start his morning shift at the City of Nelson Water Pollution Control Center. I arrived here about 6.30 a.m. I just walked a few feet to the front door and I thought I heard a noise and I paused and listened and I, I didn't hear anything again so I, I went back and I, I honked the horn of my truck and took a look around. I wasn't sure if it was uh, like an adolescent's voice or if it was a woman but it was that long help drawn out that caught my attention. Bill is joined by his co-worker Dom Castellano who also hears the cries for help. After calling 911, they used binoculars to search for the source of the voice. I finally spotted this very tiny person. Uh, she blended in with the few trees that were there and made it very, very difficult, but it was uh, something pretty incredible that we could actually hear her uh, from that distance as well. 
man, I I was yelling. And the guy heard me. I thought, oh, thank God. <laughs> I honked the horn again. I tried that earlier. Then I started looking up river, and I told Keegan, I said, just hang on. They're coming. They're coming, Keegan. And he didn't say anything. He was getting a lot quieter at the time, so I was getting a little bit worried, but trying not to show it. You know, you don't want to make the situation worse. Then I saw the boat coming around the corner, and oh, my tail was wagging. And man, I was so happy. I'm like, oh, they're coming for us. That time of year, there's, there's not very many people out there walking dogs or down by the water. I mean, they could have gone through that whole day faced with the decision, you know. Does she leave her son there, swim downstream, try to get to shore, walk out, get help, or stay there and face another night? You know, critical decisions. She made the right one. In the spring, it's extremely cold and fast down in there. The water is low. Without even realizing it, people are finding themselves, getting themselves into predicaments that they shouldn't because they inexperienced, ill-equipped, and the water's moving and it just, you're going with it, whether you like it or not. You know, it's still early spring. Sunshine is out in the afternoon. People start to, you know, feel the spring sunshine. You know, they get those, those feelings. Well, let's go for a canoe. It's nice and warm out there. They don't think about, you know, later on in the evening how cold it will get or how cold the water still is. Always be prepared. Things change. You don't have that thermal protection, the PFD. Suddenly what seemed innocent can become quite critical. Now, predicting weather, the tools of the trade. When windstorms are headed your way, it can be hazardous out there. Canada's vast wilderness can challenge even the most experienced outdoor enthusiasts in many ways. Not the least of which is the weather. What begins as a beautiful sunny day can turn ugly fast. Getting a weather forecast before embarking on any outdoor adventure can save lives as well as a lot of time, trouble, and expense for search and rescue. Thank you. <laughs> Forecasts are developed by meteorologists who use data from weather stations, satellite images, and other sources to predict the weather for a given time and place, such as the place where you are about to go to play or work in. Automatic weather stations across Canada, like this one in the Whistler Squamish area of British Columbia, use a variety of interesting tools to measure local weather conditions. The data provided by these on-the-ground weather monitoring tools helps meteorologists to maintain the accuracy of their forecasts. When windstorms are headed your way, it can be hazardous out there. One of these tools is a snow depth sensor. Uh, this equipment is used to measure the depth of snow on the ground in addition to the freshly fallen snow that would happen hourly and give us a running tally of how deep the snow is. The sensor uses sound to measure the existing snow depth along with new snow as it falls. This space age looking device is an all weather precipitation gauge. It catches snow or rain in a funnel at the top of the device and weighs it in a tray below. The amount the precipitation weighs determines how many millimeters have fallen. And this information is sent out to the forecasters to help verify the forecast and just how heavy the rain or snow is falling. When the wind is blowing, it will affect the amount of rain and snow captured by the precipitation gauge. To measure actual precipitation in these situations, a wind sensor is set up near the gauge to record wind speed and direction. To help calculate actual precipitation, versus the amount of precipitation caught during windy times. Another, much more complex wind instrument at the site is a wind profiler. It uses an upward pointing radar and sound waves, or SODAR, to detect wind speed and direction, as well as temperature profiles up to 3,000 meters above the ground. Being able to monitor temperature changes at high altitudes is particularly helpful. It's a useful tool to help the forecasters know where the freezing level is and how this may affect whether it's going to be snow or rain, especially here in a coastal location like this. It could change between the two. Amidst all the new high-tech tools used to measure weather now, you can still find some old technology that's as useful today as it's been for decades. This is a sunshine recorder. 
actually one of the few that are still left operational in the country. This particular one is probably made close to 100 years ago and it's still operational. That's the unique part about it. It just burns onto the paper behind it, like much like a magnifying glass, and the hours of sunshine are added up to give the daily total. While this crystal ball can't predict if there are sunny days ahead, it definitely provides an accurate reading of past ones. Typical chart. See the hours of sunshine that are burnt onto the chart? This chart will show just under two hours of sunshine today. While automatic weather station data is particularly useful in forecasting local conditions, there's a worldwide system in place that monitors current weather conditions for the entire planet. Twice every day at zero and 1200 coordinated universal time, formerly Greenwich Mean Time, over 800 upper air weather balloons are released at strategic locations around the world. Suspended about two meters below each balloon is a radio sonde, which transmits data on atmospheric pressure, temperature, and humidity as the balloon soars into the outer atmosphere. The balloons are tracked electronically to determine current wind direction and speed. Of the 31 balloons released daily in Canada, one of the chilliest places on record to do so is in the Arctic, near Resolute Bay. Here, Mike White of Environment Canada challenges freezing weather and hungry polar bears to launch the good old-fashioned balloons, thereby giving the rest of the world a snapshot of daily conditions in one of the coldest places on Earth. It's our complete weather report for our day of Canada. Releasing weather balloons is not as easy as you might think weather itself can be a barrier to launch. If the wind speeds are in excess of 36 kilometers, visibility less than a quarter mile, I believe the temperature is somewhere around minus 50 or so, we don't have to do the balloon. It's considered, well, you're putting yourself in at risk to frostbite. And whiteout conditions, well, you can't see the polar bear that you're trying to avoid. Personal safety is always a consideration when releasing a balloon in the Arctic. Mike checks in once he's arrived at the station, as well as after the balloon is released. And when my balloon releases, a second message goes out. If that second release doesn't go out, they'll phone the RCMP, send them our way to check on me, see I'm not out on the ground, falling down, broke my whatever, you know, running from a bear, who knows, you know. It takes about 10 minutes to half fill the balloon, and that's all that's put in. The gas expands as the balloon rises upwards over 30 kilometers. When the balloon bursts, a small parachute lowers the radio sonde back to the ground. We've got about 15 minutes or so to kind of hang around and go inside and make sure that sonde's ready to go. The balloon is now half full, ready for its 515 liftoff. They like to be precise. The radio sonde is prepped, then left outside to transmit its humidity and ground temperature readings. It's not only planes that require flight clearance. A balloon needs it too. How you doing this morning? I'm great, thank you. I'm looking for a clearance on a balloon release at 515. Thank you very much. We're gonna go launch a balloon. We get our weather on, and we're going to tie her on our balloon and let her go. Our flights are averaging about 80,000 feet at this time of year. Summertime, we're up over 100,000 feet. You look at our time. We're good to go. She's after 5:15. In the five-knot winds, see, we're it's still moving around a bit. So we'll find our sweet spot. We don't want to hit the building. And here we go, weather reports. We had a good launch. Now we're gonna go enter our ground observations and hope everything's a gringo. All right, well. Once the balloon hits 400 hectopascals, it's over seven kilometers up in the air, the minimum altitude for a successful flight, and no other balloon has to be released. We're at 700 hectopascal now, so it's considered a success. We don't have to put off a second balloon, and my day's over in about two hours. Up here in the high Arctic, Mike's work may be nearly done for the day, but across Canada and around the world, 
Weather data keeps pouring in and the forecasts pouring out. Know what to expect in your outdoor playground and be ready for change. It can happen fast. Call out search and rescue features, real stories, filmed live by search and rescue teams during actual missions. Find out more at calloutsar.tv.